day of victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win.
sing like never before on my soul. I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. Yes, I worship. Lord, we do worship your name. We worship you in truth and holiness this morning because we're not holy in our means. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of your glory. But you make us holy by your precious blood that was poured out at the cross of Calvary. We recognize that there's power in the name of Jesus. For it's at his name that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you right now. And ask that you would just help us to focus in on these next few moments together. To focus in on your word, as it says in the Psalms 109, into your image on that day when we see you in heaven. Until then, you've asked us, Father, to do your work here on earth. And part of that is praying for one another. Lord, some of us have been sick, ailing, struggling with things of life. And I pray that in Jesus' name right now that you would just heal, deliver, and set free those that have been sick and ailing, Father. We pray specifically for Russ and ask that you continue to give him strength and healing within his body. We pray for the Hoff family in dealing with the sickness. And Lord, we ask that you would just come along each of us and help us through each day. For we can't do it in our own strength, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Help us take your word into our families, to our parents, to our children, to our neighbors. For that's what you've called us to do, is to preach your gospel until you come again. Lord, we've been praying on Thursdays from 6.30 to 7.30. And Lord, we've been asking that you would just move amongst your community. Draw people in by your Holy Spirit. That those that don't know you would discover that they need you in their hearts and their lives. That they no longer have to be in bondage or sin, but Lord, you can set them free. And as it says in your word, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Let them taste and see that you're good, just as we have, Father. Now, Lord, we ask that you would just have your way and will with each of us this morning. Don't let us leave here the same as we came in but change us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to have you all here. Just a quick reminder, we have been praying from 6.30 to 7.30 here at the church. Those of you that can't make it to the church, you're at work, wherever you happen to be, whether it's at home, wherever, that you would just take time out of your busy schedule during that time and just say a simple prayer for the community. Asking God to draw people unto him, that people would be set free. I'm expecting God to move in incredible ways on Easter. Speaking of Easter, that's right around the corner. Literally right around the corner. We have, uh, again, we're doing our, our Easter outreach for the kids, which is an egg hunt on the 30th of March, which is the Saturday right before Easter Sunday. And we're asking for candy donations. 
the candy needs to be individually wrapped so that they can be put into the eggs and that and your help with that would be greatly uh, appreciated that just bring it out put it into the uh, barrel out there in the foyer it's already starting to grow and multiply <laughs> but uh, and then we got to stuff a lot of eggs a lot of eggs but that's good isn't it last year we reached uh, 70 plus kids plus the parents and it was a great time together. We give them the word of God. We give them coloring books that have the complete story of Jesus from his birth to his resurrection. And we share the good news with them. Um, that's what we're called to do. It's not just to have fun, but to reach people for Christ. Amen. Then coming up Easter Sunday, which is the 31st of March. Starting at 6.30 in the morning, I know all of you get up bright and early on Sundays, but at 6.30 on the 31st down at Scenic Beach, our church and a couple other churches joined together to have a uh, Easter sunrise service. And uh, this year our church is supplying the music, so it's, it's going to be a great time together. It always is. But we all get together and we worship Jesus down at the beach. It's nice to see the sun rising and the mountains popping out in the morning. It's a great opportunity to be encouraged. And then at 1030 on Sunday morning, we'll have our regular Sunday service, but we'll be focusing in on the resurrection. We've been started our Easter series last week entitled Eden, the Cross the veil, and the garden. And we're looking at how each of those focus in on different aspects of the resurrection story and what they mean. Last week we looked at the Garden of Eden and how sin entered in through the serpent. We looked at who the serpent was. We looked at the, uh, the way Satan enticed Eve and Adam to sin. And we looked at the various steps that were there, how being confronted with suggestive and enticing, tempting thoughts, we looked at uh, about entertaining those thoughts and what we can do about it. We looked at the consequences of doubting this God's word. We looked at thinking that one would be fulfilled and, and that the things that we would be gained, such as knowledge, if we took of that fruit off of that tree. And uh, we learned more about the steps of recognizing sin in our lives. The reason why we did that is so that we might be able to identify sin and the temptations when they're coming against us so that we might escape. Jesus always provides a way out. And we just need to look and recognize that Jesus is with us, even when we're being tempted. It says that he's never left us nor forsaken us, but he's with us every step of the way. Today we're going to go to the next step. We're going to look at the cross, but we're going to look at the cross through Isaiah chapter 53 and the suffering saint, the suffering servant. You see, it's here that we get a great picture of what Christ did while he was there on the cross. Isaiah 53 is probably the what I would call the summit, the Mount Everest of biblical prophecy. In this chapter alone, the Savior of the world is seen as suffering for the sins of mankind. His death is described in surprising detail. And for true believers, Isaiah 53 is one of the most heartbreaking yet most cherished passages of Scripture. For it describes the brutal treatment, the horrible sufferings of Christ, and what he endured on our behalf. The marked feature of Isaiah 53 is the vicarious, substitutionary death of God's suffering servant, the promised Messiah. And he emphasizes that theme over and over again. Isaiah predicts that the Savior will die. And let's look at that this morning in Isaiah chapter 53. And actually, I'm going to pick it up at the end of chapter 52 to keep everything in context this morning. Isaiah 
Isaiah 52, verse 13 says this, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of a child of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told, they will see him. And they that have not heard, understand. Which brings us to chapter 53. We need to keep in mind that when the scripture was written, there was no chapter markings. And we are keeping everything in context. And he's continuing with a testimony. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 53, he says, Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from the men who hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and like a sheep that's before its shears and silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he has been take, was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, to put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. You see, Isaiah predicts the death of the Savior. It says in verse 5, for our transgressions or our, our sins. It was those things that he was crushed for our iniquities upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Paying the penalty for us, the Savior sets us free from the bondage of sin, death, and hell. You see, he's taking our place on our behalf, in our stead, for us as our substitute. Through his death, we've received from Christ the most amazing healing and, unre healing and, and salvation of our sins. When we think about or meditate on the sufferings of Christ, it will literally break our heart as we read through all the things here that are mentioned about him. Christ bore the sadistic, brutal treatment that was due to us. Every one of us. And grasping that truth is bound to drive us to the ground on our faces as we seek the Lord. It's interesting that the prophecy about the Messiah's suffering was written more than 700 years before the coming of Christ. How then do we know that the scripture is a prophecy about Christ or not somebody else? Well, let me give you five testimonies, five statements showing that this is Jesus. First, Isaiah predicts time and again that the God's servant will definitely be the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, 
and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. And these passages are reflected in the New Testament, repeatedly identifying Jesus Christ as the Messiah promised by God. In Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 16, it says that, that at that evening they brought to Jesus many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And this was a fulfillment that was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Did you get that? He took our infirmity and bore our diseases as a fulfillment of Isaiah. Matthew chapter 11, and beginning in verse 2, says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples, and he said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go, tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Next we have the testimony of Philip, the evangelist. And he identified the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 with Christ. He was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, as we find out in Acts chapter 8. And here, the, the eunuch comes along Philip, and Philip says, Do you understand what you're reading? And, and from that moment, he said no. He began to teach, to instruct him about the meaning of Isaiah 53 and how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the suffering Savior. Then we have the testimony of Paul that this chapter refers to the preaching of the gospel and to a person's confession of Christ as the Savior of the world. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, verse 9 and 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Further in Romans 10, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he's heard from us? You see, over and over again in the New Testament, it goes back to the book of Isaiah, giving testimony that this is the Christ. We have the fourth testimony coming from the Apostle John that says Isaiah 53 applies to Jesus. And it says in John chapter 12 and beginning verse 37, it says, Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be filled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been, to sh been revealed? And then we have the fifth testimony. You see, for 1,700 years after Isaiah wrote these words in Isaiah 53, virtually all rabbis, all sages and Jewish scholars interpreted Isaiah 53 as being messianic and identified God's servant as the Messiah. In the Talmud, the, the Sanhedrin verse uh, 98, Zohar, Rambam, and others believed this chapter was talking about the Messiah. And yet, after the 20, 12th century, during the Spanish Inquisition, when Jews were being converted to Christianity against their will. They began to interpret Isaiah 53 as being the nation of Israel. Up to then, they believed it was the Messiah. What changed? Because they were, again, being persecuted by Christians. And they were taking a stand that it, it was too much like Jesus. Too much like Jesus, who was a suffering servant, who was sinless, completely innocent, and unworthy of death. The prophecy does not concern a nation that they believe today, but it is an individual. And that individual was Jesus. Isaiah 52, verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. 
for that which has not been told to them they see, and that which they've not heard they then understand. You see, Isaiah 53 is a graphic description of the suffering servant of God. He sent his son to save the human race. We saw last week in the Garden of Eden how sin entered into the world, how Satan was tossed out of heaven because he wanted to be higher than God. He wanted to rise up. And we saw the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh begin to influence mankind through Adam and Eve. They took of the garden of the knowledge of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one thing that they were not supposed to eat of. And because of that, they were separated from God. As soon as they ate of that fruit, sin came into their lives. It was there that the relationship with their God who came down in the cool of the day and would walk with them in the garden. They recognized that they had sinned, that they had done wrong, and they hid themselves from God. That's something we all try to do at times in our lives, to hide from God, to hide our sin, the things that we want to cherish rather than surrender. The things we don't want to give up. And yet that's what we desperately need is a relationship. A relationship with God. When sin entered into the world, this great gulf, this great canyon came between us and God. What could repair that gulf? What could bring us into a relationship with him? And it's there that we find as we continue reading about the sin in the garden, we find that when God comes on the scene and he says, who told you that you were naked? And he judges the serpent to crawl on his belly. He gives the woman to have pain during childbirth. He gives the man that he would have to work with the hands of his labor. But then he gives us the promise. He has a plan already in store for us. A plan to bring us back into relationship. And that plan comes a simple little statement where the serpent would bruise the heel of man. But man shall crush the serpent's head. That little promise is the first promise of the Messiah coming. He was already putting in steps the idea that the Messiah would come. It's for our sins that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. When Christ came to earth, he bore all of our grief, all of our sorrow, all our infirmities, our weaknesses, not only on the cross, but in his life. He bore the penalty of our sin, suffering on our behalf. The Apostle Matthew even says that Christ, bearing our infirmities and sorrows, applies to his healing ministry. Matthew chapter 8 verses 14 through 17. He says, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And this was to fill what was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. All our sufferings on earth are due to our flesh and the corruptible world to which we live in. The result of sin, the penalty for sin, which is the consequence of Adam's sin, entered into the world. 
Uh, that's not to say that everyone who's sick and, is, and suffering physical pain is being punished. It's not that at all. But Scripture says when Adam sinned, death with all of its corruption entered into the world. When Adam and Eve bore children, those children inherited the parent's sinful nature. It was passed down through the whole entire human race. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of, of God is free, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the truth is that Jesus died for us all. We deserve to, to pay the penalty for our sin. For we're the ones who broke the law, both of man and of God. At the very least, everyone has, ha has managed to mistreat others. All of us have at one time had evil thoughts. All of us have broken one of the Ten Commandments. Therefore, we all stand accused before God. And he pronounces his verdict guilty. The sentence is spiritual death, eternal separation from him. But there is good news, wonderful news, and that's that God has executed his judgment upon us. He executed his judgment upon Christ. It was Christ who died to pay the penalty for our sins. God's servant, the Savior, Jesus Christ, died for our transgressions, our iniquities. The word transgressions, tesha there, are acts that, well, that we cross over a line that's been drawn by God. To transgress means to revolt, to rebel, to rise up against, to reject God. Picture a, a, a sign if you will, that, that says no trespassing, and yet we ignore it. The transgressor deliberately disregards the warning and chooses to sin by going past that sign. Isaiah uses another word, iniquity, awan, which means the perverse, the crooked, the, the moral evil that lies within the human heart and nature which means that we are sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice and by nature. We willfully choose to sin. And we've been born with sin in our lives. Christ was wounded for us on the cross when his hands and feet were pierced by nails, when the spear was thrust into his side. It was the heavy weight of our sins that crushed the very life out of Christ. The purpose of Christ's death was twofold. First, he died to provide peace and healing for us. Look at verse 5. He says it was ver well, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Sin contaminates God's presence. It separates us from God. Because God is holy and perfect, he can have nothing to do with sin. And consequently, a great barrier or gulf separated sinful people from God. No one can climb the barrier. No one can bridge that gulf. For sinner is unacceptable to God. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. He hates sin because it is sin that brought us so much brutality, wickedness, and death into the world. It's because of sin that alienates us from God, putting hostility between them and making enemies. It's this alienation that causes some people to curse God, to curse the Son of Christ, and others to deny or defy God. It was for this very reason, this very reason that God sent his son Jesus into the world. He came to make peace between God and man. By giving his son to die for the sins of the world, God demonstrated his great love for people. 
peace with God, my friends, is possible. It is possible. If people will just turn from their sins and approach God through Christ, believing that Christ died for their sins, God will accept them. And he no longer will seem like he's so far away, that he's unconcerned, that he's out of touch. No longer does the barrier, the separation, have to exist between God and us. Through Christ, we can be reconciled with God the Father and have peace. Christ forgives our sins and saves us from the coming judgment that will fall upon his enemies and the rejectors of God. Think about it. The great wonder of by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this in verse in chapter 5. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ Jesus, being reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. For for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might have become the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 16 says, Now in Christ Jesus you were once far off and been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one and broken down the, his flesh by dividing the wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, and so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. First, or Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 and 22, he says, Through him to reconcile of himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in the body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. You see, Christ died to deliver us from the penalty of going astray. He delivered us from going astray like sheep. Now, sheep have a tendency to go astray, to wander off. They're always keeping their head down. They're eating grass, getting nourishment for their bodies, but they're not paying attention to where they're going, and they wander off from the herd. It's within their very nature, just as it is with us, to wander, to reject God, and to break his commandments. There's three aspects in our human nature that causes us to drift away. We learned about them last week. The lust of this world, the lust of our flesh. We learned that that we need to be reconciled, that the, the lust of this world wants to pull us away from our relationship with God. And in looking around, we see things that are attractive, that are desirable, enticing, valuable. This is what Scripture calls the lust of the eyes. And then you have the pride of life, the, pro- the, the position, the, the power, the, the fame that are, are used for us to get ahead is supposed to be used to serve others, not to exalt ourselves over them or to communic- uh, accumulate wealth, but it's to be used to serve and help others. We like sheep have gone astray. And when sheep go astray, they're in danger of getting lost, aren't they? They're in danger of being attacked, of dooming themselves, because if they they lay down 
and fall over on their sides. They can't get back up. They need the good shepherd to come along and to pick them up and to rub their legs and get the circulation back in them. They build up gas in themselves and, and they can't get up. When we turn away from the Lord, one enemy after another seems to attack us through mockery, ridicule, and charges of hypocrisy. And of course, getting lost can doom us to an eternal separation from God. But there is good news again, that Christ died to deliver us from the sin of going astray and from its penalty, which is death. Note what ex exactly what Scripture says in verse number 6. He says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bared the sin for us. It was for this reason that Christ died for us. He laid on him iniquity of us all. God the Father took our sin that was upon us and actually placed it on top of Jesus. It's our sin that crushed him. It's our sin that killed him. This is what's known as the substitutionary vicarious death of Christ. He died as our substitute in our place and on our behalf. It says over in John chapter 10, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for sheep. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we are yet st still sinners, Christ died for us. We've already read Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the one that came for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. We're told by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 that he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Again, in the next chapter of 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, For Christ suffered once for sins, for the righteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but alive in the spirit. He came to die for us. And that's the importance of Isaiah 53. As we see, we've seen how through the testimony of, of Jewish sages, of how they interpreted the Word of God. We saw the testimony of Paul, testimony of Philip, the testimony of Isaiah, that these scriptures all tie Jesus as being the Messiah. We learned that Jesus came and was crushed by our, our sin that the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. He went through a horrible death on the cross. But that was to save us from the gulf of sin, the gulf of our relationship that cannot be bridged without a sacrifice being made. And that sacrifice was the willing life of Jesus 
to bridge that gap and bring us into relationship with him. Maybe you're here today and you've never really thought about this great gap in your relationship with God. Maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with him. Or that you've once did, but you walked away. But I want you to know that Christ is here amongst us today. He's promised in his word to never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us wherever we happen to go, and he's here now. And he's reaching out his hands as he reached out through time, seeing us being here today, recognizing that he, when he was dying on the cross, was bringing us back into relationship with him. Maybe that's you today. You're wanting to be brought back into relationship. You want to start afresh with Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask that we would just bow our heads for a moment. And I'm going to ask, where are you at in your relationship with God? Are you far from God? Or are you near to God? It comes down to this. You're where you want to be. You're as near to Christ as you want to be. Because it's our choice. God came near to us. He's asking us to come near to him. If you're here today and you want to start a new relationship with him, if you're here today and you're saying, I've, I've walked away, but I'm coming back to a relationship with Christ, I want to start afresh. I want you just to raise it up, your hand up to God, just recognizing that you're signifying to him that you're wanting to start a new life. I trust then that everyone has a relationship with Jesus. But we all can be closer with God. And I ask right now, Father, that as we recognize in your words that we need you. We need you to be our Lord and Savior. We need you to bridge that gap, that gap of relationship with the Father. And we ask you right now to draw us close. Because, Lord, we're drawing close to you. And you say, if we draw close to you, that you will draw close to us. And as we draw to you today, we ask that you would just manifest your presence in our life. That wherever we went and go, that you would let us sense your presence that we would recognize when you're leading us to the right or to the left that we would recognize when the opportunities come and cross our pathway that we should testify about you that we should share the good news with you about you with those around us that we would be able to lead others into a relationship with you as we ourselves have. Father, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for helping us to recognize that we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. Thank you for helping us to recognize that we need a Savior, that we need a deliverer, that we need a healer. 
be those things to us, Father, on a daily basis. Help us not to take it for granted that, that you're with us. But let us spend time with you and reading your word and meditating upon that word and, and living that word in our lives. Help us to be examples to others around us. Help us to realize that without you, we're lost. And yet you brought us peace. For while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for bringing us into relationship with God the Father. Thank you for being our Redeemer, but also our healer and healing us of our infirmities and diseases. Thank you for being our God. Now, Lord, as it says in Numbers chapter 6, I pray the priestly prayer over your children and ask, Father God, that you would bless us and keep us. That you would shine your countenance upon us and be gracious to us that you turn your face towards us and give us peace. Let us go from here this morning, Father, into our mission field to reach others for you and to do the, the works that you planned ahead of time for us to accomplish. And let us go in your strength and in your power and in your authority to do those things. And then let us come rejoicing, rejoicing, into your presence once again, rejoicing at people being brought into your kingdom. Bless us now as we go out into that harvest field, Father. And thank you for not leaving us alone, but being with us every step of the way. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next week. We'll be talking about the veil in the temple next week. Bring someone with you, won't you? God bless you and have a great week.